Hey guys, it's John from JSP. I recently did a beam swap in my A86 and wanted to make some YouTube videos on how to do the swap yourself. It's going to be three different videos. Part number one, buying the engine and getting it ready to install. Part number two, getting the car ready and getting the engine installed into the car. And part number three, hooking everything up and getting it running correctly. So let's get started on part number one, buying the engine, prepping the engine, and getting it ready to install. The fifth generation 3SGE Beams engine came from the Toyota Alteza. It came in three different versions of the manual transmission, the G1, the G3, and the G5. The G1 was from 1998 till early 2002, the G3 was from 2002 and 2003, and the G5 was 2003 and newer. There's a few things that I look for when I'm buying a used Japanese engine. I like to go to the importer if possible, and I like to pick the engine myself. The most important things that I'm looking for is that the engine is complete, there's nothing major that's broken, it's not missing any sensors, and overall condition looks pretty good. Most engine importers will offer to clean the engine for you, and I usually prefer to not do this because I wanna see where the engine was leaking and what things that I'm gonna to need to address when I get the engine ready to install. Before any engine swap, I wanna disassemble the engine and make sure that the condition is good. I'm gonna go ahead and take everything apart. I'm gonna clean everything as well as I can, and I'm gonna do a major service on the engine by replacing seals and gaskets and giving the engine just a complete tune-up to make sure that it's gonna be reliable once I install it into the car. Sometimes the engine will come with a label on it showing its last maintenance record. This engine has about 60,000 miles on it, and as you can see, the timing belt really needs to be replaced. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the timing belt and all the seals and bearings on the front of this engine. As I disassemble the engine, I usually take note of where things are located. I'll take pictures underneath the intake manifold of the routing of the hoses, the connectors, the wiring harness, etc., just so that I have a reference for when I go to put it back together. As you can see here, this engine had quite a few oil leaks. It was pretty gross. So as I'm disassembling the engine, I'm gonna keep note of what seals, what gaskets and things that I need to order so that when it's time to assemble the engine, I have them all here ready to go. Once I get the engine all stripped down, I'm gonna get it up on an engine stand and do a last major cleaning just so that when I'm working on this engine, it's not gonna be super greasy and gross. As I was disassembling the engine more and started pulling the ignition coils out, I realized that the valve cover gasket was leaking very severely into the spark plug valleys. This is a major problem and uh, the valve cover gasket set will definitely need to be replaced. As I pulled the valve cover off, I was very happy to see a clean engine inside. There was no gunk or uh, burnt oil on any of the surfaces. It was very clean inside, which indicates that even though the engine was leaking oil everywhere, it looks like it was changed pretty often. Next, I pull the timing cover off and inspect the timing belt, the bearings, the tensioner, the front main seal, all the stuff on the front of the engine. In this case, I'm gonna replace the cam seals, I'm gonna replace the front main seal, the water pump, and all the bearings that I can get my hands on uh, before assembling it again with a new timing belt. One thing that's necessary when swapping the beams into an A86, if you have a power steering rack, is to remove the mid oil pan off of the engine. And there's an area on the bottom of the oil pan that contacts the steering rack. It's just near the back here where the flywheel uh, attaches. And uh, usually when I'm doing this, I'm going to remove quite a bit of material. Take note of the areas that are cut away. This is going to be required if, again, you have a power steering rack. If you are using a manual steering rack, it's not required. After reinstalling the oil pan, I'm going to go ahead and mount the engine mounts onto the engine. Followed by a new thermostat, and I'm going to use one of our short thermostat housings here. It makes routing the lower radiator hose a little bit easier when doing the swap. Next, I'll install our upper water neck. This makes the upper hose easier to install. But to do the install, you're gonna to have to shorten this bypass hose a little bit. I like to use a brake line cutter just like this one and work it down until the end of the hose breaks off and it makes routing the hose real easy. 
after doing all the timing cover stuff, uh, front and rear main seals, new valve cover gasket, and getting the engine all sealed up and ready to go is usually when I move on over to the transmission. The Beams J160 transmission came in two different variations. The early model transmissions have an aluminum shifter stock. This later model transmission has this steel shifter mounting stock. In either case, a shifter relocation kit is usually recommended. As you can see here, the shifter relocation will move the shifter forward about five inches onto the very top of the transmission instead of out the back side of the transmission. This will allow you to mount the engine in the car without cutting the hole in the floor where the shifter comes through, and it'll still be able to retain the factory shift boot and a nice OEM fitment. This step is not mandatory, but I highly recommend it. The fuel lines on the A86 get really close to the transmission bell housing, and shaving off this portion really helps when uh, needing to access those fuel lines and just getting your hands around the bell housing when you're working on the car after it's installed. The Beams engine comes with this dual mass flywheel, which is extremely heavy. In this case, the clutch, pressure plate, and clutch disc were both pretty worn out and needed to be replaced. After changing out the rear main seal, it's time to move on to installing the new clutch and flywheel. The clutch kit was ordered from eBay, but the pilot bearing and the clutch release bearing were both ordered from Battle Garage in their OEM. Before installing the Cromali flywheel, we first need to press in the pilot bearing. There's a step on the bore of the flywheel that indicates where the pilot bearing presses down into. It's pretty important that it presses down just until this step, no further, no shorter. When installing the flywheel, you're going to torque the flywheel bolts to 62 foot-pounds. This usually requires locking the flywheel in place so it doesn't spin while you're torquing it. I have this little flywheel locking tool from a 13B RX-7 that I've kept in my toolbox forever and I usually just find some way to make it work on every engine. Flywheel bolts are torqued in a uh, opposing pattern just like torquing a head down. So you're going to torque one bolt and then the bolt across from it and then 90 degrees and then the bolt across from that until you're completed. Before installing the pressure plate and clutch disc, it's important to clean off the mating surfaces, remove any grease and residue that could be absorbed into the clutch disc itself. Next, I install the pressure plate bolts as fast as I can with my fingers. Usually this will allow the pressure plate to clamp a little bit harder and also do better burnouts. With the pressure plate bolts finger tight, now it's time to align the clutch disc. I usually put the alignment tool in and sort of roughly feel where about center line is. It's important to note that even though the clutch alignment tool is in place, you can still wiggle the clutch disc around. And if it's not centered, then when you go to install the transmission, you'll have a tough time getting the transmission onto the engine. What I usually do is I'll vertically up and down move the alignment tool and find the center line visually of when the clutch disc is centered. After I have that centered, I'm gonna tighten down one of the pressure plate bolts until the clutch disc no longer moves. It's very important that this alignment tool moves in and out of the clutch disc without any resistance or applying any pressure to get it in and out. Much like the rest of the engine, the clutch release bearing was shot and in desperate need of being replaced. Also inside of the transmission bell housing, the clutch fork had basically never been taken off and greased and was completely dry. The clutch fork pivots on a little ball that's uh, inside of the bell housing and it's important to grease both the ball itself and also inside the clutch fork before reinstalling it. You're also going to want to grease the surface that the release bearing slides on inside of here. Uh, this is going to ensure that there's no binding when you're pressing the clutch in and out. This 5 8 to 3 quarter inch heater hose adapter normally mounts on top of the engine, but I'm going to mount it behind the engine here. I'm going to trim the hoses, and this is going to allow me to reuse the 5 8 hoses and then adapt to the 3 quarter inch hoses on the Corolla. Now it's time to bolt the transmission back on and get it ready to install for the very first test fit. Part two of the series will go over installing the engine into the car, including the first test fit, pulling it back out again, and then getting ready to do the final install.